Good morning to our viewers here in the United States and good afternoon to our viewers in Europe. Happy New Year and welcome to our first event of the year. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany. I had not anticipated that our first event of the year would focus on the storming of the US Capitol by Trump supporters. But I'm pleased to have two experienced journalists with us today to talk about what it's been like to report on the events in Washington last week and their ramifications. Today's event is co-hosted by our German circle of friends, the Freunde des American Council on Germany e.V. The Freundeskreis was created to try to offer more programming for ACG alumni, members, and friends in Germany. It goes without saying that the world was watching when thousands of pro-Trump protesters convened outside the US Capitol on Wednesday, January 6th. We've all seen the images of what happened next when they disrupted a joint session of Congress to count the electoral votes and formalize Joe Biden's election victory. After breaching the perimeter, the rioters occupied and vandalized parts of the building. The storming of the Capitol led to its evacuation and a lockdown and five people died. Some members of Congress feared for their life. Juliane Schäuble, the US correspondent for the Berlin Daily Der Spiegel was in Washington and covered the developments. And the next day, NPR's Rob Schmitz reported from Berlin on the response to the day's events by European leaders. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Juliane, you moved to Washington in June of 2018 to cover politics in DC and in the US in the run up to the 2020 election. You also spent a lot of time trying to get beyond the beltway and report from other parts of America. Did you ever think that you would see democracy in the United States come under attack through an assault on the Capitol? Hello, everybody. One thing, I'm not working for Der Spiegel, I'm working for Der oh, Tagesspiegel, which sorry. is a very important <laughs> distinction. Um, I, I have to say, I did not expect seeing pictures like this, even though one can expect a lot of things happening and we have seen a lot of ugly talk and we have heard a lot of ugly, like, ugly talk, but I did not think this could happen and I don't did not think American security forces would let this happen so it's like uh, it was a big surprise what happened last Wednesday and it it is um, it is still I think it's still a shock to everybody who is watching and who takes this seriously. So Juliana where were you and what was it like to, to report this story? I had, um, I was not in the capital when it happened, um, which as a journalist, I kind of regret as a, a human being. I'm, I, to, I, I told you I'm not so sure about that. Um, I was at the rally of Trump in the morning. I was walking around between Congress and the White House and saw all these protesters and um, many of them um, were angry. It, it was a tense situation, but it was also, like a like a Trump rally very often was. So you heard a lot of people saying stupid things in, 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 in my view, and a lot of um, the election was stolen and you have to stop it. Um, and I saw them walking towards the Capitol. And at some point I had, I had to decide I did not have credentials for that day to Congress because of COVID. They kind of um, really tried to, to keep it small. So I went home to watch um, um, to watch it to watch the ceremony um, on TV, and when it happened, um, I just couldn't. I saw it on Twitter very very quickly that something was happening, and um, and then just get into this work modus where you have to call your colleagues in Berlin and uh, tell them what's going on, and that we really have to change the newspaper, the print edition at that time, um, in the next two hours, and that's what we did the next hours, and it was. A, became a very long day um, and a very long week since. Well, and and I wanted to, to touch on um, one of the other projects that you've been involved with, with some colleagues at the Tagesspiegel. Um, in the run up to the election, um, you've been producing a newsletter called 2020, now 2021, which was designed to inform a, a German speaking audience about what was going on um, 
in the run-up to the election, immediately after the election, and presumably through the inauguration. Um, my guess is that you were planning last Thursday's um, buy talk or contribution to be on the results of the runoff election in Georgia and the significance of those elections for the incoming Biden administration. Instead, you wrote a very personal and impassioned piece about what you were seeing unfold at the Capitol in, in real time. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's these Wednesdays, <laughs> these days, I, I read my newsletter part um, Wednesday night, and um, when, you, when you have to react to what's happening, you, I think it has to be personal because everybody feels something seeing these pictures. Um, and um, um, yes, I was, because I was in Georgia end of last year and um, and I saw the two I saw the four candidates and I saw Mike Pence campaigning and and it was really um, it was I mean they were impressive but it was really surprising that the Democrats won both of the seats so that was that was supposed to be the big story um, uh, even though even in the first edition of our newspaper we had that story and then we had to change it a little bit and um, I'm, I'm kind of sorry for Ossoff and Warnock that they were not um, <laughs> they did not get the attention they deserved. No, I think I think that's right. For many people, the big news of the day was the results coming in that morning. And of course, that was very quickly overshadowed by what happened um, at Capitol Hill. Um, Rob, you've been based in Berlin since August of 2019. And before that, you were NPR's international correspondent based in Shanghai. So you have lots of experience both as a foreign correspondent, but also um, watching what's going on at home from abroad. Uh, having spent much of my life abroad myself, what was it like for you hearing about the news about the developments at the Capitol from so far away and in a completely different time zone? Yeah, it was pretty surreal. Um, yeah, so I've, I've lived outside the United States uh, for 11 years now. So uh, nine of those in, in China in almost now a year and a half or so Uh, here in Germany. So, you know, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's strange, you know, as, as you know, when you've lived abroad for that long, you come home and, you know, certain things change, but, you know, you sort of just file it somewhere in your brain. And um, so what I saw, I guess, last Wednesday was, was so, somewhat shocking, but at the same time familiar. Uh, and it's weird to say that, but, you know, I, I, I think it might help to explain you know, my background. And, and, but, but first, I'd like to share an anecdote with everyone about where, where I was when I, when I was watching this. Um, my wife and I were both journalists here, and we have two young sons. Um, one of them is, is uh, eight and the other is 12. And you know, because they've lived their whole lives abroad, uh, we do our best to try and teach them as much about um, our democracy in the United States as much as possible. You know, whenever we vote, we have them look at the choices, we, we talk about each of the candidates and then we send it in together. So last Wednesday, uh, for us, it was evening. I was done with the day uh, or so I thought. <laughs> and I, I, we just had dinner and so we were sitting down all together and our, my wife and I, our plan was to show our kids Uh, the, the final electoral, uh, you know, certification and explain what was going on to them. And so we were doing that and, you know, they were sort of sitting down. They had to say a few questions about who was talking, why are they objecting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then they got a little bored because, you know, there's a lot of procedural things and, you know, just their kids. But then um, what became what was intended as a civics lesson then sort of went haywire when, you know, the the insurrection ha started happening when people started pushing their way into the Capitol. Um, and then of course, my boys were suddenly glued to the television. I mean, the, the, for them, this was like watching a, a bad action movie or something like that. Um, and so they it was hard to get them to go to bed, but m my wife and I, I think were more just, just to watch that was was just so sad for me. Um, and I was on the verge of tears. I don't, I don't cry very easily, but we both were, were just really upset by what we were seeing. Um, and I think part of it is that, 
I think the part of it that made me really sad was was that um, the I you know what well, what was happening wasn't that shocking because I, I think that we all sort of knew that this could happen, um, and I was I guess I was more shocked that there wasn't much security that prevented them from coming in. That was that was surprising to me. But what I guess what was just sad about it was that I, I don't see a way out of this. And, you know, I grew up in a small town in uh, Minnesota. And when I grew up there, uh, you know, everyone in my tiny little town, we didn't really talk about politics too much. But I, you know, I grew up in a, a union family. My mom and dad were both union members. And um, I've stayed in touch with uh, some of my old friends from that town. And, uh, you know, we're Facebook friends. And over the years, it's been interesting to see their posts and how political they've, how much more political they've become since Trump has become president. Um, they, many of them are Trump supporters. And uh, now I would say more than a few of them, uh, it seems from their posts and from their images that they share are now QAnon supporters. And uh, I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not friends with them anymore, but I, I'm watching a lot of these posts more as a journalist and almost with an anthropological interest in it because it, it fascinates me. You know, I, I sort of understand why the way, you know, the way that they feel because I, I, I've seen my town and how it's changed over the years and how globalization has impacted the town. And, and ironically, I, I spent much of my career in the very place that benefited from that globalization, China, right? And, and moved from a place where people were losing their jobs to a place where people were getting those jobs, you know, in China. And so I've talked to workers on that end as well. And, and just, you know, putting that all together and seeing what was happening with the, the siege on the Capitol last Wednesday just reminded me of how far we have to go as a people and as a country to, to get away from this. Uh, and I, I don't think it's going to, you know, it, it's, it's hard. It's, it's, you know, I personally don't think it's going to, this can't be solved in four years. I think it's, it's something that we as a country really have to, to examine. And um, as a journalist, I, I hope to be a part of that. Let me maybe ask both of you a question, particularly based on, on what you just said, Rob. Um, I, I got a little bit of criticism um, for a, a, re a recent note that I sent out to, to some of our members um, saying that I felt that the events at the Capitol had really underscored for me how deeply divided the U.S. is. Um, I, I think I knew how deeply divided the country was um, based on election results alone, based on um, sort of the finger that I have on the pulse of, of what's going on um, in the U.S. Uh, over the last few months. But for the two of you, how, how deep do you think these divisions are? And I mean, Rob, you just said it's going to take a long time to come back from this. One of the, the big challenges for the Biden administration is to try to close some of those divisions. Um, you don't seem to think they'll be able to do that in four years. But what's sort of the path forward? No, uh, have, you, got it. you want to try this yeah. one? The, the problem is now we have uh, impeachment um, coming up and um, uh, you can see it in all their faces. They know it's not really going to help to, to unite the country, even though um, I guess most people in the Democratic Party think there's no way not to do it. Um, but it's, um, it's not the start we would have wished a um, new president has. So um, it's, kind of, it's kind of going back to 2020 again. I mean, it's only uh, one year ago when we had the last impeachment uh, and um, that was the start of, the crazy, of this crazy year. And now we start the year the same way, um, uh, even more crazy. So I think that's um, going to be an extra burden. I still think and I still hope and I'm probably sometimes too optimistic, but as, as, as I think this, this country, this people is um, able to, to push the restart button at least a little bit. Um, I don't think half of the Americans were willing to storm the Capitol and uh, do that. Um, I think they, that's what sometimes happens in, mass, in masses. 
that 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 people get drawn into really bad actions. There are lots of and, and you, you talked about the QA thing, a QAnon, and that's really something that is super concerning because it happens so fast. Um, but I think some if if Trump has gone, some part of the Republican Party, I hope, will free themselves from Trumpism. I hope. But we will see. Yeah, and I just to answer your question, Stephen, I'd like to use a quote that uh, my colleague, Esme Nicholson, uh, who I work with here in Berlin, um, she she went out on the street gathering a bunch of tape the other day, uh, kind of getting people's reactions here in Berlin. And she found a high school politics teacher uh, named Clara Rienitz, who had a quote that I, I thought was, was this was my favorite quote of, of anyone she's got. So, um, she said to her, um, she says, I always tell my students that we have to learn how to live and participate in a democracy again and again. Everyone must be given the right, the space and the time to participate. If democracy becomes so gridlocked within its own structures that you can only play along but not take part, then you must question the strength of that democracy. And I think, you know, in some ways, I, I really like that because I think it's, it's, it's this learning how to live and participate in a democracy again and again that I think is lacking in the United States, or at least the perception of it. I think that that, that is part of the problem is that, you know, when I see, for example, I mentioned some of my old friends from where I grew up, you know, I see them going down the path of these conspiracy theories. I, I know what their lives are like, and I, I've I've seen how they've they've become more and more disenfranchised. And I, you know, I also see that they they feel like they are they they just don't have a place in this participatory democracy anymore. And that that in Washington, because of the effect of money and corporations and you name it, uh, that politicians can't be trusted, and so they're they're choosing an alternate path. And I think psychologically, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and I think that that's, that's, you know, that's one explanation, but I think there's a lot of economic reasons and social reasons and technological reasons. I mean, we have to talk about social media here too, because you know, social media is relatively new in our society. Uh, you know, and so I think that obviously this has played an enormous part um, in, in Trump's presidency, as well as uh, the beliefs of, of his followers. But I think all of these things have sort of converged to, to create this. But there, just one thing, there were also a lot of people who just voted for Trump because they wanted to profit from his policy. And, and I think there is hope. I mean, the tax cuts are not more important than a living democracy. So I think at some point, these people have no excuse anymore to go down that road. Um, you, you cannot enable somebody who does not understand what democracy is about. Um, and uh, if something good comes out of last Wednesday, I think that that is clear now that you have to, you have to choose where, which way you want to go. Well, and I think it's going to be, a, as both of you have said, a, a rocky road ahead, um, not just here in the US, but in, in other democracies as well. Um, Rob, you started to share sort of some of, in, in, in sharing the quote from Clara, you started to share um, some of the reactions from, from the man, the woman on the street. Um, but I, I heard you, I guess it was a week ago today on NPR's Morning Edition, um, together with your colleagues from Beijing and Jerusalem, talking a little bit about how world leaders were responding um, to the news. And I, I'd be interested in, in sort of your take on the initial response, but also how that response, how the reaction might be evolving as the dust settles and we, we learn more about what actually happened. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think that we all saw some of these responses from European leaders. Um, uh, you know, I think it was mostly horror and shock. Uh, Boris Johnson of the UK, now officially out of the EU, uh, urged uh, for a peaceful transfer of power. He said it was a disgrace. Uh, but then right after he said that, his political opponents sort of jumped on top of him and saying that, you know, you didn't do enough to, to call out President Trump's lies uh, after the election, which resulted in this very insurrection. 
Um, Emmanuel Macron said, uh, we'll not give in to the violence of a few who want to question democracy. And he said that what happened last Wednesday was, was not American, which, which I thought was kind of an interesting. Kind of, I mean, that, he's not the only leader that said that. Uh, Josep Borrell also said, this is not America. <laughs> Just like, which I guess my response to that is, yes, it actually is. It's, it's you know, you know w wake up. Um, but uh, here uh, in Germany, Angela Merkel uh, made brief comments to the press. Uh, she's been pretty busy lately, so she didn't have too much time to really kind of talk about this uh, at length. Um, however, uh, uh, Frank uh, Walter Steinmeier did, I think. Um, her brief comments sort of focused on criticizing Trump, saying that she regretted that he hadn't conceded to feed. And then she reminded people that in a democracy, winners and losers have to play their parts with decency. Uh, so that democracy remains secure. But um, she did say that it was a sign of hope that Congress worked through the evening uh, to confirm the victory of, of uh, Joe Biden and uh, Kamala Harris. Um, but when you look at, it's interesting, when you look at like next door in Poland, you know, which is run by a very similar populist right-wing party as, as Trump's now Republican party, uh, the Polish president Andrzej Duda had a, what I thought was kind of interesting response whose sort of vagueness of spoke volumes about the position that he currently finds himself in. Uh, he said, and I'm going to quote this, the events in Washington are an internal affair of the United States, which is a democratic and ruled state. Power depends on the will of the voters and the security of the state and its citizens is supervised by the services appointed for this purpose. Poland believes in the power of American democracy. So a fairly painfully vague tweet that maintains loyalty to Trump uh, while not jeopardizing uh, Poland's ongoing relationship with the United States under the new Biden administration. Um, as to how this is evolving, um, it's kind of interesting. Over the weekend, uh, Germany's Foreign Minister Heiko Maas um, called for something really interesting. He said he called for a joint Marshall Plan for democracy. And he warned that without democracy in the US, there is no democracy in Europe, which is a pretty bold statement. Um, and so, you know, I, it, it's interesting. I, I don't think that things are evolving that much as far as our responses are concerned. But, um, you know, it's been, it's been interesting to follow some of this. And, and of course, you know, when we look at anything now in Germany about any, what any politicians are saying, especially with this as well as with vaccinations and anything else, we have to remind ourselves that this is an election year in, in Germany. And so there's, there are some politics behind some of these responses. Absolutely. Um, you know, one of one of the things and, and you've kind of touched on, on some of these 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 topics already um, that I wanted to ask you about is is I think many of us follow what is America's standing in the world and what you know contributes or detracts to that standing. Um, yesterday, the House voted to impeach Trump for a second time. Um, Juliana, that's something that you were covering very, very closely. And so after that second impeachment, um, after the assault on the Capitol, do you think that that Trump and Trumpism are diminished? But do you think that America's standing in the world is diminished? Or do you think that the response that's being taken is one that helps shore up the standing and, and actually a little bit more confidence in democratic institutions and practices? Or is it too early to tell? Is that is that for Juliana? Or for yeah, yeah, I mean it's for both of you. But I, I mean, I was thinking Juliana could start, yeah. um, but but Rob, I'd love to hear your thoughts on on that too from abroad. You know, I have to agree that Wednesday night, when the parliamentarians went back into Congress and finished what they had started in the morning, that was so impressive. That still gives me kind of a shiver. I think that's just unbelievable because you could really hear yesterday and yesterday I was in the house um, 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 part of the day. So you could really feel how emotional, how personal these attacks were for some of the, uh, some of the uh, congressmen and women. So, um, and so I think they, the system has worked. I mean, it was an incredible short amount of time that it took to, to impeach President Trump the second time, um, one week, that's unbelievable. Um, and I don't think we can say yet how it's going to end. There's probably lots of doubts and for good reason that the Republican Party is turning away from him. 
Um, but what Mitch McConnell says is interesting, and it's interesting to follow. And it's um, and I know he's a lifelong politician, but I also think any everybody has 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 feelings and has emotions, and I think he is shocked by what had happened um, even before the, um, the the storming of the Capitol, even before when when Trump pressured um, um, government officials and his vice president and 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 so um it isn't in, in, in it's it's moving so it's it's not yet decided where it goes um i think it's important that this impeachment started even though joe biden is not a fan of it and many democrats are not a fan of it um, um so at least um they are trying to hold president trump accountable and his followers but it, what it does with the standing of this country, um, I think it has has to be, we can say this after we have seen what Joe Biden is capable of doing the next four years with um, the help of his party and the obstruction of the other, some parts. And Rob, any any thoughts from you? No, I agree. I mean, I, I think it's it's hard to, I think it's a little early to, to, to know the answer to that, but I mean, if you look at who voted for Trump, there's still millions and millions of people, tens of millions of people that that wanted him to be serving a second term. So, and I think that they've been emboldened and they've been given a voice. Whether anyone thinks that's right or not is another question, but they have that now. And I think that that's different from five years ago, is that I think that they didn't have that before and they do now. And I don't think they're going away. And mm -hmm. I think it's gonna, it's gonna take, like I said and before, I think it's, this is gonna take a while. So one of our viewers um, asks whether the two of you had an opportunity to see Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger's YouTube video about the storming of the mm -hmm. Capitol and his comparison with Germany and Kristallnacht um, and whether you have any comments on that comparison, but also um, whether you have any thoughts on the political and cultural frailties in Germany in the 1930s and the U.S. and whether that's a, a justified or appropriate comparison. <laughs> I would say I'm always careful with comparisons to the Nazi regime, especially as a German. Um, I think what we have seen Wednesday, and we still don't know everything, and the more time goes by, we, we learn more. And, and um, I hope you don't learn that this was planned from inside of the capital, I think that would be shocking. Um, so we, we, I think we saw what human beings are capable of and, and we, we are not smarter, we are not better than people 100 years ago. I think we learned more, but we are still capable of being, of, of following the wrong, the wrong leaders. Um, and um, that, is, that is disturbing. And, um, um, but as a German, be careful with um, comparisons of, um, I, I and think I think we can, he was Austrian, so half Austrian, so <laughs> that is different. <laughs> yeah, and I used to cover Schwarzenegger as a reporter in, in Los Angeles. I was covering, uh, I, I, I actually spent two weeks with him in China. Uh, so I covered him <laughs> when he was governor before I, I, I lived in China. And um, to see him, say those things. I, I thought it was a really, you know, obviously it, it went viral for a reason. It, it came from a very personal kind of painful part of him, right? You know, I don't think he's ever talked about having a dad who abused, basically abused him, right? And, and, and talking about the reasons behind that, some of the social reasons behind that. I thought that that was really interesting. I, yeah, I, I agree. I thought the comparison was a little, you know, it's, it's not good to compare that, that event to a, a, a different comparison that's a, a different comparison that's being made um, between more current developments in Germany and the U.S. Um, is drawing on the events in late August when um, a demonstration in Berlin against government measures to slow the spread of the pandemic uh, led uh, several far-right activists to try to. Um, breach the barriers surrounding the Reichstag and get into the Reichstag. Um, they were pushed back by police. The building was secured, right? So that the ultimate outcome was very different, but they were trying to get into the seat of government much in the way that um, the insurrectionists were trying to get into the, the Capitol building. Um, 
I think one could argue that the, the protesters in Germany reflect a, a loud minority intent on, on rolling back these government policies related to COVID. What happened in Washington was, was much worse and much, much bigger. Um, but there is a trend that's unfolding there. Um, and I'd be, be interested in, in both of your thoughts on that trend. Um, Juliana, you've, as I said, been, been out and about in the country trying to measure the pulse of what's going on in America at the moment. Um, do you sort of see what happened in Washington as, as part of that trend? Um, and then, then Rob, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some of the work that you've been doing on, on right-wing extremism um, in, in Germany and Poland. I mean, one thing really, and one thing that both countries have problems with is um, the conspiracy the theories of QN. And, and um, I think it was a rally with um, Donald Jr. in Pennsylvania um, last year when I noticed that so many of these people attending the event were talking about things that you can find were spread by QN. And so, and like very strange, um, very quick and very for me, very quick um, um, change of, of, of things that they wanted to talk about. And they all said the same thing. So um, apparently um, um, the brainwash has really worked. Um, I don't know how to, how to I, I think the, 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 the power of pictures, the power of movies, the power of um, frightening somebody, even um, um, the capital of uh, the United States, um, um, uh, that is something that 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 people like. I mean, they 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 like these pictures. They like these like the, the words of the storm of the capital. I mean, I'm not sure the storm of the, on the Reichstag is the right impression. We had a debate about this in, in our newspaper, um, but but of course people were trying to get into it, trying to frighten at least people, probably to hurt some. We don't know that, and you always have people who probably are capable of of of, of hurting them. Um, and, and since yesterday. You're not allowed to to, to bring a gun into um, the capital anymore. At least there's a metal detector in front of it, and um, even that led to protests on on parts of the Republican politicians, which for a German is astonishing um, because I don't think a gun should be in a um, in a public building anyway, um, uh, for just for like a politician carrying it around. But that that's probably a difference to Germany. I don't think you have that many weapons carried around, um, but the, the, the amount of um, threat potential is, I think, similar. So Rob, you, you've been, as I said, been reporting on right-wing extremism um, in Germany and, and in Poland. To what degree do you think that events like the one at the, the Reichstag or the Capitol are part of a, a larger trend? Yeah, I, th I, I think it's all connected in some ways. I mean, I think, I think um, here in Europe, we didn't see kind of the the resurgence of this until after 2015, right? And that's when when migrants, uh, when when Merkel, you know, made the decision to to allow migrants to gain asylum here, um, and you know, I guess less so maybe after the 2009 financial crisis too, where we saw more and more you know kind of this coming back uh, in, in Germany, but. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I think it comes from the same type of mentality, right? I mean, there's there's a fair amount of racism. Obviously, there's there's an idea that um, the government shouldn't be in our lives, that the government is bad, that the government serves no good purpose. Um, rejection of that, um, and then you've got the politicians, right? Who who kind of are, you know, are very similar. Not not exactly like Trump, but I would say of a populist. Ben, right? You know, when I first came here, one of the one of the first, you know, this is you know, I've I've not been in Germany that long, but my my first six months before the lockdown, I spent all of my time traveling around the eastern part of Germany because that's what I wanted to understand better. I felt like Western Germany would would be something that I'd be familiar with, but I, I wanted to understand the mentality uh, behind, especially the off day. Uh, and so I talked to a lot of their supporters. I talked or tried to talk to a lot of supporters. Um, I, I had one instance where I went to the small town in Brandenburg and, and 
<laughs> I, I was basically just like yelled out of town, but like Lügenpresse, Lügenpresse, like people were just yelling that at me, right? The lying press. And, and it was interesting, it was just, you know, because it, it's such a difference when you talk to Afde supporters, right? And you're a journalist, they see you as the enemy and they don't want to talk to you, uh, generally speaking. Some of them do, but most of them do not. Um, however, the people that represent them in the Bundestag are more than willing to talk to me and are, are actually eager to talk to a journalist like me uh, because they want to get their message out there. And so it's a very, it's a very interesting parallel, right? Is that, that, that you have off-day representatives whose entire purpose, like Trump, is to get out there on social media, get out there in the media, use the media to your advantage, and then the people they've and they've convinced the people not to talk to us, right? Because they they own the press, right? They're 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 the ones that are going to be using us. So that's similar too, and that I found that really interesting as well. And that and that's interesting because at um, Trump rallies, um, like if you talk to the people standing in line or in on in these halls or whatever, they are super nice, super friendly. Um, when you're German, ah, I was stationed in Germany and, <laughs> and in all this. And, and, um, and then there comes this, these moments in, in, on every Trump rally when they turn against the press and then you are the enemy of the people and they yell at you and they, they have angry faces. And then you talk to them one hour later and they're like, oh, no, it wasn't personal. I said, well, I take it personal. Yeah. And then something happened um, in the last month when you were asked, so what kind of press are you? Are you Antifa press? And I said, I don't know what Antifa press is. <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> I'm, I'm working for a newspaper that apparently has different opinions in its, uh, in its, uh, its inside. So th that, that was something new. And the, the whole Antifa thing kind of got into their head. And um, now I'm either Antifa mainstream press or um, uh, good press. <laughs> so. right. But normally they are they are more friendly than in Germany um, uh, and more open to, to talk to us. Even Jim Acosta, I mean, he like this typical um, moments when they yell at him and then the next time they want a selfie with him because he is a famous person. I mean, um, yeah, it's showbiz. So at some point, it's, it's so, so maybe this, some point. this is the question you know that gets kind of to the the craft um, of what the two of you do, right? I, I think for for so many of us, it's it's been very difficult to um, navigate this new world of, of fake news and alternative facts. And, and Juliana, you touched on some of the conspiracy theories. Um, and I guess one of the, the questions is, is, how does one try to address that um, and educate and inform people so that they have a common set of facts um, and we have a common basis? Um, what are your, your thoughts on, on how journalism can, can contribute to that, how the media can contribute to that? I mean, one, one, one thing is that you always try, like I would always try to convince them that it's nonsense what they are saying, but as a journalist, it doesn't make sense to, 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 to try to uh, convince a conspiracy, conspiracy follower that he's wrong. But I think we have to do what we always do. We, 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 we have to try to report what we know. And if we don't know, we have to be open and, and, and honest. And um, um, I, I mean, many of the things I, I heard Trump supporters saying, I, I did not even write down because it was just like, there's no sense of like, copying it and making it, bring it into the world. But sometimes I think perhaps we should have done it even worse. That perhaps we should have, like one to one, write down what they've said. Like Dem Democrats want abortion until after birth, and I said no, I don't think they want that. Yes, it is. You can read it. You find it on this website. And like all these like very crazy things going on in their heads, um, and um, and we have to. I mean, we, we can describe what's happening and describe what people say, um, and then we yeah, and don't jump. Probably, but well, that's important. Don't jump on any any excitement just because it's 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 big news we have to be careful what we report that's what we but it gets harder i guess for radio too <laughs> yeah yeah I, I would agree with that i think just by doing our jobs uh you know that that's what we just have to do and i i i don't really think that there's much else that we can do you know our jobs are to um present facts 
and and to tell stories based on facts and and to and to find those facts in a methodical way and we're trained to do that that's what we do but it's difficult you know we've i think journalists have lost a lot of respect over recent years because of social media because social media makes everyone a journalist right and and so you know they many folks then see you just as fake news right because they, they don't understand maybe that that uh you know, we've earned the platforms that we've gotten to by good work and by work that's been vetted by the public and by experts. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and they have a platform too, but it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a social, social media platform mostly. Both of you cover politics and I guess, you know, politicians and, and the political elite have a role in, in dealing with this challenge as well. Um, do you see um, the politicians sort of trying to address this in a forward-looking way, or is it something that that is is not being taken on um, adequately at that level? It's not easy, is it? I mean, look no, at look at the debate not. on Twitter and banning Trump from Twitter. Is any regulation has has severe consequences and um, the, the kind of long for quick actions and decisive um, things. But then after, after, after another thought, we, we kind of noticed it's not, most of the time it's not that easy. Yeah? You have to be, I mean, you have to can regulate. And I think po politics has, has to be able to do regulation um, anywhere. I mean, nothing can be just uncontrolled, but with the amount of information spreading a local government will always be the slower than the spread of information and you were in china Rob, so um, i'm not sure we want to follow that direction in controlling the flow of news yeah i mean for the last six years of my time in china i, I covered probably what is the most successful populist in the world uh xi jinping and and uh, not many people call him a populist. He definitely is a populist. Interesting definition, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and he's a successful one because he's also a technocrat, um, and he knows how to govern. And I think that's the difference, right? I mean, Trump is also a populist, but unfortunately, his governing skills were lacking, and that is why he's not serving a, a second term. That's why Americans didn't vote. Uh, for him to to repeat his, his first term but someone like Xi who has now total power uh, after he's changed the constitution in China uh, is someone who is much more adept at governing and figuring out ways to make sure that he continues to have power so um, yeah it's been interesting to move from there to Germany, where you you know there's been obviously a, a history of that, and then to see this happening um, in the United States, at least shades of this. One of our viewers writes that she lives in the UK, where the BBC tries to be balanced and therefore tends to interview both opponents and supporters of the Trump movement. Yeah. As journalists, do you think it is right to be broadcasting statements by Trump supporters? that are demonstrably wrong and or hateful. NPR has also come under a lot of fire for this. Um, and I'm not gonna answer that question because I think it's, it's, a, you know, it's a tough one to answer, but, um, but I, I will say that that is a great question and you should write to, your, to, write to the BBC to let them know what you think, uh, because I think that's what it takes. Um, this is, you know, we are public media, and we are here to serve the public. And um, if you're concerned about that, and you're a member of the public, uh, you know, I, I can speak at NPR, we care about those letters and we read them. And I would say, I mean, it would be dangerous not to know what they think. Um, that's what we all discussed after 2016. How could this happen? Um, how, why didn't we not really um, get it? Um, now we know what they think. <laughs> Um, we have to report it, but we can also, we can also, the next sentence can be, but this is not true. And it's not, um, Trump says 
the, his vote, his, his victory was stolen. And we say, no, there are no proofs for that. And then you have, we have courts and we have um, extremely good working courts in the US. I was impressed by that. Uh, that's one of the good things from last year, I would say, how, how well the courts reacted, how decided. And um, so, but that's what I said, that like, uh, you have to, you have, you cannot just do it and then say nothing with it. So you have to kind of try to fact check these sentences. Some are easy to like abortion after birth. It's easy to say that's probably not a fact, um, but some are more difficult. And um, um, I mean, the whole Corona conspiracy thing and then Bill Gates and all this, um, it's uh, you have to say it every single time. This is what is what is not true. That's our job. Even well, though it's boring. <laughs> I mean, of course, there's been a lot more fact checking in in the last few years than there was before that, and I think that that's um, you know partly due to President Trump, but also partly due to the social media trends that that Rob was talking about too, um, of just there being this need to check the facts um, because everybody can report from wherever they are with their smartphone. That's why we, we need we need sources we can trust. I mean, uh, the, the the fact checkers of the New York Times and the Washington Post, and, and, and they are amazing. And I mean, I cannot do that on my own. I'm the only um, correspondent for my newspaper in this little country. Um, and so I have to trust their work. And I'm happy that we have news outlets like NPR and 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 you know times and all these where you can where you think there are people who know their job and who want to do a good job. So that's the dangers of like destroying the belief in in media all, all over. So be before I ask you a, a both a closing question, we have an, another viewer question that that sort of touches on this, um, which reads as follows: What do you think of the allegation that distrust in the news? has been exacerbated by liberal biases creeping into supposedly objective news coverage. I, I'm not a fan of that argument. Uh, I've, I've heard that over and over. And um, I, I, I think that that's, that's a trope. It's been used over and over. I don't think that's true in any way. Um, the journalists that I know, and I've spent now 20 years as a journalist, surrounded by journalists, um, they work very hard to find what they think is the truth based on the facts that they're getting um, and, and the facts that are available. And, and um, it's not, there's no political bias behind that. Um, but I, I can also understand why many conservatives think that there is a liberal bias in the press as well, because um, it's, you know, yeah, I, I won't go into that, but I, I, I reject that. <laughs> well, you know, I would say everyone has a political opinion, everyone, every single person. Um, um, but if I would only write what, what I think has, is, is the, the only way of writing, I would not be a journalist. I, I think I would have lost, I would not even get my, my, first, uh, my first job at my newspaper. Well, in a, in a somewhat humorous response to this conversation, somebody's written in the chat, um, in, in these days, saying that ketchup is not a vegetable is interpreted as a liberal bias. <laughs> and I always say, if we can agree that one and one is still two, then I'm fine, because I cannot prove that one and one is two. <laughs> I have to believe that it's true. But, but Juliana, I think that, that that is sort of the the sad state of where we have come. Um, it used to be that one could agree on the facts, even if one interpreted those facts differently. Um, I think today there are more and more things that are touted as facts that need to be checked because they're incorrect. And that has helped to create some of the divisions um, and allowed people to believe different things, have different interpretations. Yeah. But as we as we start to, to wrap up, I sort of wanted to, to take a step back um, a little bit because we received a question from from one of our viewers that I think actually is a, a great close, closing question and and allows us to sort of put what happened into a 
a broader perspective. Um, and I'd be really interested in hearing what each of you has to say on this. Um, the viewer writes, to what extent do you think it is possible to treat this event, the storming of the Capitol, as a growth opportunity for the purpose of strengthening the German-American relationship? The shared values message has lost a lot of oomph over the last years as attacks on marginalized communities have become a theme of the Trump administration. Germany has a lot of experience recovering from a fascist mindset. Um, I guess at the core of it, I wanted to say, you know, we hear a lot about the shared values that Germany and the United States have. Um, it's sometimes hard to see those values, but is what happened at the Capitol last week, not a call to action to reaffirm what some of those values are and to sort of protect and defend democratic institutions and practices? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, when I mentioned Heiko Maas comments this last weekend, I think that's exactly what he was getting at, is, is that we need to have some sort of, I mean, he called it the Marshall plan for, for democracy, but and that might not be the right terminology, but basically we, as, as you know, two Western countries that have uh, similar systems of government and values, um, we need to do our best to try and save our shared values, our democracy. Uh, because when you look at what's happening in the rest of the world right now, especially with regards to China, um, you know, it's clear that there are other models out there that are doing quite well um, and whose weaknesses aren't apparent right now. Uh, but to anyone who's covered them, they're obvious, including to me. Um, and, you know, when I see something like uh, recently the EU-China investment treaty, you know, th that was, a lot, a lot of people made a lot of, a big deal about that. Uh, you know, saying, oh, I can't believe that they did that. Well, I, I can, I, I, I totally get it. You know, after four years of Trump, I mean, it's, it, it makes sense that, that, that you would do that. And it's just, it's an investment deal. Um, but at the same time, it's an investment deal. This has bigger implications. It, it, it drives, especially Germany, uh, closer to China. And it also provides leverage that China will have over Germany. And that's political leverage. Um, and that can lead to dark places. Um, so I think, you know, in, in this era, um, you know, with the new administration coming in, yes, I think that's a, that's, that's a great idea, um, is to try and reassert those, those values. Um, I just hope that, um, I hope it works. And, and, and I think it's, um, it's just getting back to, like, talking to each other regularly warning you, the other country if you put out a travel ban like all these little things that haven't happened the last years i think that's already going to be progress it's going to be normalizing and it's it was a warning a warning signal what has happened last wednesday that um, we should all be careful not to 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 work against our own institutions and like like, like ridicule policemen politicians um uh, journalists uh, uh, kind of lower your way of aggressiveness in, in your rhetoric. I think that would be a good a good um, uh, um, learning from, from what had happened. Well, Juliane Schäuble from Der Tagesspiegel in Berlin and Rob Schmitz from NPR. I'd like to thank both of you on behalf of both the ACG and the Freunde des American Council on Germany for spending this last hour with us to, to talk about what happened at the Capitol last week, but also much, much more. Um, and certainly in the, the weeks and, and months ahead, we look forward to staying in contact with you and, and following your reporting on what's happening on both sides of the Atlantic. Thanks a Thank lot, Stephen. Thank you both.